Okay, apologize, I will have an external microphone in here. So I didn't even think about it. That was just a silly mistake. I should have known that it was soundproof. I can't because it doesn't mount if you don't have the case on it. Volleyball, we have the tripod, that's different. So, um, and the sound in that thing, I tried with without the case on it, um, like what you were saying, it doesn't sound very good. It's very soft, the microphone's really small. So I'm gonna get an exterior mic tonight and, and I'll record and I'll just have the mic sitting here and you can hear me. It, trust me, it sounds good. I walked around the room and I tried it out. And it'll sound okay, so. Okay, so, oops, that's not your stuff. Today, we need to continue on with section one one. Uh, we are going to get homework today on that. I know this is crazy. We are going to get homework on section one one today. It'll be due on Monday next week. Okay, so you got some time to work on it. You got the weekend. And I'll give you time tomorrow in class and stuff. So, of course. an 80% chance I'll be online. Okay, so good to know. Uh, the good news is the video will be online. And it'll have sound. Yeah, I won't uh -huh. be able to watch it right away. No, that's fine. It'll be, it won't be on until tomorrow night. So you can watch it this week. I'm gone all weekend. I'm gone until Monday. Uh, it's fine. Okay. Watch it during the studio. I don't have to study on I know it's a struggle, right? It is a struggle. Question. Oh, okay. Um, back of the room, bottom shelf. Um, if you want one of the book covers, there's one already there. I recommend the one of the book cover because I believe the pages are all still in it. So there was there was two books I had yesterday where they were literally missing like the, the first chapter. Like brand back over there. Over there, binding. Yeah, open the doors. Oh, yeah. Bottom shelf. Yeah, the one with that rubber uh, book cover, that's the one you want to use. And I'll get the number from you at some point today. She didn't okay. have a book cover when she grabbed it. Hmm? Yeah, she had books when she yeah. grabbed the book cover. She didn't grab it. So, just make sure you have the checkers in there. So, it should be fine. Okay, here, here we go. Uh, let's, let's walk through uh, the main topics for today. Uh, yesterday, we talked about the expressions. We talked about uh, numerical versus algebraic. Um, today I'm going to do one or two examples of what you can expect in the homework, and then we're going to move on to the next part, where we have to talk about uh, uh, intersections versus unions. We have to talk about the different sets, the real numbers, and then the properties of real numbers. And there's a couple things. So it's, it's going to go quick, because some of the stuff you already know, so you'll be comfortable with it. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. I don't want to skip something if you're not comfortable with that type of math, so that we cover it and you're, you're good and you have your bases covered. Okay, so we're on section 1-1 one, one again. Uh, we're going to continue, and we're going to hopefully wrap that up today. It's called Algebraic Expressions. Yeah, it's P1, sorry. I just realized I wrote P1. I think I need to fix it online. I think I just put it as 1. So. All right, um, so Algebraic Expressions. The big thing, numerical versus algebraic. What was the difference? Okay, good. Yeah, the big thing was, can you simplify it? We're not solving. We are simplifying a problem down as far as we can. That's the difference between numerical and algebraic. That sometimes algebraic can't go any further. You know, you had a bunch of X's and a bunch of Y's. You can't really add those together. So it can only go so far. Numerical, you just have a bunch of numbers. You should be able to get down to a single digit in the very end. So uh, I know, like, some of the problems that get, like, these Crazy things going on. And you do something like that. You're like, whoa. Okay, what do you like? What do we start with? Well, you have to think about the order of operations, right? You have to go through the order of operations. So that's that's the little acronym PEMDAS. That's what we talked about. That was a big deal with this section, and I just want to make sure that we're comfortable with. That, that concept, because this problem to me is just big. It's not difficult, it's just big. There's a lot of things going on there. So let's talk about what is this little acronym stand for? Okay, so everyone's talking about what? Parentheses, right? Parentheses first, you gotta go inside the parentheses, and if there's more, you go inside of that. So brackets are parentheses. So you go inside those, then you work your way out, and if you're inside a parentheses still, you gotta finish it all out, and then you gotta work your way out. So it's like a little onion working inside out, little shells to it. Okay, so we're gonna go inside the parentheses. We're inside the brackets, and we're inside this parentheses, and we have to finish this first. So three plus two, five. Okay, so we use different colors, so we're at five. And yes, I am writing all that down because that's what I expect you to do, and I will do the same with my work. Okay. Now we are still inside the brackets, correct? We have to finish.
finish it out. So you have to finish a bracket, a parenthesis, before you can move out of it. So we have to do the exponents. So we're set, still technically going left to right, and we're still following the order of operations. So we did the parentheses in here. Now we have to look at exponents in here. So 5 squared. 25, yeah. That is 5 times 5. That's what 5 squared is. It's not 10. Don't make that silly mistake. Okay? So it is 25. And at this point, now we have to finish the parentheses going left to right. So we're still in here. There's no more exponents. There's no multiplying. There's no dividing. There's adding or subtracting. We have subtraction. 4 minus 25. Come on. And now we have to finish the cube on that. So we have to go 21 cubed, and it's negative. Because anytime you, you have a negative number and you put it to a power of 3, it stays negative. Odd numbers stay negative or positive over there. Even numbers always cancel out everything. They're always positive and negative. So it's an odd power. So we know it will stay negative. It's fine there. So 21 to the third power is literally 21 times 21 times 21. Yeah. Somebody have a calculator in here? You want a nice one? Jack, you got that big fancy one. Yeah, you do. Which one? I don't know. Michael, I don't worry. I've spent way more on calculators than you. One of my calculators in college was $300. 9,261. Ooh, same here. 9,261. Okay. Now that's, that's negative, right? Negative 21. So I think about that. You don't need to have the negative, too. So. Um, the big thing is why I did that, um, why I wanted you to, to think about the odd power and negative, is because some people get, get it wrong when they type it in a calculator. But, like, they they think way too, um, too much about it. They're like, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go negative 21, and I'm going to put the power 3. And that's what they type in the calculator. Why? You know it can be negative. Just put the negative down here. Why would you want to type it in your calculator? You'll just get it wrong. You know it's going to be negative. So don't, don't type that in. The reason why, why I want to warn you of that, because when you do this, when you go negative 21 squared, right? And it's supposed to be negative 21 squared. Let's say it's like that wrong. What should that answer be? Positive. If you type this on your calculator, so Jackie, can you type it in for me? Just type in exactly how you see it right there. Sorry, you just put it away. That's okay. Or, okay, we have uh, Ramana here on it too. Just type in negative 21, hit the square button. What happens? Oh, problem. It's, it said his answer is negative. What is it, negative 441? Uh, it shouldn't be negative. What's the problem there? The, yeah, you forgot the parentheses. It's a dumb mistake. It's a simple operator error. Because your calculator didn't know any better. Your calculator took 21 squared and just left the negative sign out front. Because it doesn't know any better. It didn't know you were supposed to put parentheses there. So that's why I want you to always avoid that stupid situation. Just know, like when I look at that, I knew the answer was going to be negative. So I'll put it there later. I don't need to worry about it. Don't. don't Rely on your calculator to do everything for you. Think about things common sense. And now when I multiply these, I know the answer will be negative without even having to type it. Five times whatever that number is. I know it'll end in a five, it'll have a zero. Carry a three, carry a 13, carry a one. 46,305. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Oh, no. I have no idea. Okay, there you go. So we feel comfortable with like, the order of operation stuff. Remember, I don't mind they have calculators. Great, fine, gain. Don't rely on them to give you everything. <laughs> Common sense sometimes will help you win out that route. OK, so that's, that's numerical. It went, it's simplified down to a single digit. You have to be comfortable doing that today. You're going to do that a lot today, because they're going to give you algebraic problems, and they're going to tell you to plug in numbers in so maybe this was your problem. Maybe that's your problem that you have. Okay? It's the same problem I just did. 
same problem. You're just plugging in the 4, the 3, the 2, and you're just solving it out. Okay, so just be mindful of that. You're plugging in numbers today. You're trying to simplify it down as far as you can. Okay, I know there's a couple problems where they just ask you to simplify an algebraic one. You know, they'll have you distribute. We'll get to those problems here in a minute, but do we feel comfortable with that first? Like, that's stuff we did yesterday. Okay, good. You guys are pretty calculated. Should figure you guys would be fine with that. Okay, now let's go on to the next step. The next thing we need to talk about, we need to talk about intersections versus a union. There's a huge implication to this later. It's um, what this is, what these two objects are. It's a way of writing sets of numbers. Sets. Okay. What do you mean by sets? It's a way of like writing answers down when there's more than one answer. Like there's a group of numbers that make this problem work. Um, so it's sets or an interval. That's another word that you'll hear a lot. I think maybe maybe you did some interval notation last year in algebra two, perhaps. We'll cover that this year to make sure that you're very good at it. The reason why I would not feel comfortable letting you leave my class without having to know what a set is or an interval. That would be a nightmare for you if you go to calculus without knowing what those are. Okay, so let's talk about this first. Let's talk about an intersection. And I'll explain it. I'm going to use the easiest way to describe it, and then I'll give you what the book did because they did a really clever way to describe it. So okay, this is a set. Let's start with that first. I'm going, to use, I'm going to use roster method. Roster method is a way of writing a certain set of numbers down. So, somebody just give me three or four numbers. 7, 11, 18. Oh, that's quite okay. 7, 11, 18. All right. That's a set of numbers. Agreed? Okay. Now, in intersection, we'll be using an N. They put this, this weird little N down, and then they'll have another set of numbers right behind it. And I'll just make up some numbers for this one. 3, 5, 7, 11, 18, 18. That's a roster. It's just random numbers written with, separated by commas. Typically, a roster method is written least to greatest. Least to greatest. That's usually how they put it. Sometimes they don't. It's supposed to be. Okay, now what does this mean? What does this whole intersection mean? What does this symbol stand for? Because sometimes they don't have a tail, they put like a plus and a union. What it means is you're looking for the numbers they have in common, the intersection of both groups. So, what numbers, when you look at this list versus that list, what numbers do they share? Seven, eleven, eleven. Seven, comma, eleven. That's the only numbers they have in common. Okay, it could be just one number. What if it's none? Okay, you don't write none. There's actually a, there's actually a symbol for it. So, okay. So do we feel comfortable with what an intersection is first? Okay. Now, the way the book describes this, and I'll get to the, the idea of having no, nothing in common. Um, the way the book describes this is: imagine you had like one group of numbers here, you had another group of numbers over here, and the intersection. Is that part. So what does that look like to you? Exactly right. It's the, probably the, the most common sense way to describe it for somebody. You're literally forming a Venn diagram of this bubble with that bubble, and you figure out where they cross or the numbers they share. That's it's brilliant. It's the best way I can describe it for somebody. Okay, so that's the, that was the way the book described it in a little tip off to the side. We showed that yesterday. Okay, so this is your answer. You have to put the set, you have to write the numbers down in common. Now, let's get to that idea, like, what happens when they don't have anything in common? Okay, so maybe I didn't have 7 and 11. Maybe I had, um, we had uh, 4 and 6. Okay, so when they don't have any numbers in common, now we have a problem. Nothing. They literally share nothing. The Venn diagram is empty with commonalities, like common similarities. So, if it's empty, we use the symbol for the empty set. It's a circle with a big line going diagonal through it. This literally means the empty set, or uh, if you go to like a Calc 1, Calc 2 course, they'll call it the null set. Null meaning none. Do we feel comfortable with that? 
you're literally going to have a couple of those in your homework. They're going to ask you, okay, look at this set of numbers, look at this set of numbers, what's the intersection? It's mind-numbingly easy. You could do it in three seconds by looking at it. But the problem is most people forget what the little n means. Intersection. N. Okay, we're good so far. Okay, let's move on to the second type, because I said there was a second type. It's called a union. I'll go back to the original numbers that we came up with earlier because I like those. 7, 11, 18. And now the new symbol is a U for union. Right? 3, 5, 7, 11, and 13. Okay, a union now is not just looking at where they intersected, it's looking at the entire Venn diagram, the big picture. So before, you know, we talked about, okay, this thing cross this thing, where you look at the intersection here. This thing, this, this symbol for union, I want the entire bubble, both bubbles, and I'm going to put them all in one. So what do you think your answer is going to be? All of the numbers. So let's list all the numbers least to greatest. 3, 5, 7, 8, 11, 11. Notice I didn't put repeating. I don't need repeating. When you do it like a set like that, you don't need to put repeating. It's not like a, what was the idea that we talked about in geometry or in algebra class? It's um, there are different notations for it's escaping me. There's a term in algebra class where you have to write all the numbers down and you have to write, if there's multiple entries, you have to write those down. Yeah, a double root is almost exactly the, that's, the, that's the concept that it was raised off of. But yeah, it's a little bit different. But yeah, you're on the right track, though. Okay, any questions with union versus an intersection? Intersection, they literally, the numbers they cross, they share. Union is just everything. It's everything. Just combine it. Okay, so that's that's one type. Now, the reason why they bring this up is, and I know this seems to be like, well, why would we use that? It seems, it seems unimportant. This, uh, this idea of coming up with answers like this in sets is actually a way to describe numbers like the numbers that make a problem work. So sometimes like when you're given a when you're given an equation later in this book, is that a lot of a lot of precepts is like learning ways of solving really, really difficult equations. Like what's the answers for this problem? And so I'll just give you just an easy example, something like this. This is my function, right? This is something we'll learn later. A lot of numbers make this thing work. You know, you can plug in any x value, you'll get answers out of it, right? But there's one that doesn't work. What's this? Yeah, negative 2, right? Negative 2 doesn't work. You're not allowed to put a negative 2 in there. Because if you did, it would make 0 on the bottom, and you're never allowed to divide by 0. That doesn't make any sense. It's incorrect math. So that's why they, they teach you how to use this, like, method. You're actually, in your head, when you're thinking about numbers, I can plug in any number. I can plug in all these negative numbers up till negative 2, and then I have to skip negative 2. So what they do is we start with this easy roster method, and then they start bridging into the really difficult way of writing intervals. Answers for problems where you don't want to write the full set of numbers. I don't want to write every number in the world from negative infinity up to negative 2, skipping negative 2, and then going to positive infinity. It, it'd be impossible. You can't write all the numbers down. So they teach you this quick way of writing an interval really short. It's like a shorthand version of doing this. So the, the way to write that is they do this. They go from negative infinity up to negative 2, skipping negative 2, doing a union, so that's where the union comes in, starting at negative 2 and then going up to positive infinity. And this is something we're going to learn. This is an interval. The things that you learn, negative infinity is like really small negative numbers. Positive infinity is a really big positive numbers. And this idea in the middle is I'm doing a union. I'm adding this group of numbers to this one to get all of my answers for this problem that make it work. The parentheses in the middle, when you use parentheses, it doesn't include that number. I'm not including a negative 2. I'm skipping directly over it. If I use brackets, it includes that number. Now you're probably wondering, well, I didn't use brackets on the outside. Infinity is not a number. 
I don't know if I don't include it. I think it's a symbol. So we don't, it's not a number. If it was a number, I'd put a bracket there. So, and I don't want to do this. Because I know some people are like, well, what if you use a bracket like this? What if I go to negative three, include negative three, and then I include negative one, and I go up to the positive infinity, right? What if you did that? Because now I'm including negative three, that's fine. I'm, you know, I'm doing a union, so it looks like I'm skipping negative two, starting at negative one, and going up. What did I just skip, though? I didn't just skip negative two. And I skipped all the numbers between negative three to negative one that I could have used. Decimals, fractions. Negative two and a half was fine. Why did I skip that number? Because I went to three. I included negative three, but I didn't use anything past that. I didn't go negative 2.9, negative 2.8. I skipped that number. And I went to negative one, I went up. So that's why this is the correct answer. I just skipped one number. That's where the parentheses come into play. I know that seems difficult. We learn this eventually. Does that make sense? Like this, you're starting with the easy stuff, and there's a purpose to it later. Okay? Okay. Now, I've probably just scared some of you because you're like, oh my God, I don't know that. Calm down. Okay. So, let's move on. Let's go to the next part here. We need to talk about the real numbers. And then we'll talk about the properties of them. Okay, real numbers. Real numbers, if you don't remember geometry, we started the very first day of geometry talking about the different categories of numbers that we learn, that we, we focus on. It's like an outline for the year. It's kind of the same thing for us. There's an outline for how we we need to learn pre-calc so it makes more sense to us. So that developmentally, you you build. You're not like just getting thrown in deep ends and trying to trying to survive that. Okay. So for the real numbers, there's a certain way you are supposed to learn real numbers when you're in when you're in school. Okay. The first set of numbers you're supposed to learn is in elementary school. It starts with a capital N. You know, you know the category of numbers that start with an N. Starts with an N, literally an N. Negative? Nope. Uh, natural. Natural numbers. Natural numbers are the first numbers you learn in like preschool, kindergarten. Anyone know what the, the first natural number is? One. Yeah. Natural numbers. You start with the number one. And then you work up two, three, four, and you go up to a thousand. You know, by the time you get to third or fourth grade, whatever you get to. So, like kindergarten, it's like to ten. And first grade, so like a hundred. And then you go past that. Right? Those are the natural numbers. You start with one. Seems goofy. Why wouldn't you start with a different number? Well, one's common. That means it makes sense. You have one in something. Okay? So you start there. And, you, and what you do is in like first grade, you start learning how to add and subtract them. You get to third, fourth grade, maybe second grade, you start learning how to multiply for the first time. And dividing. Dividing is like a nightmare for a lot of people. They just hate it. They probably still hate it. Okay? Then we get to the next group of numbers. It starts with a W. Anyone know what number you start with the whole number? Zero. Start with those numbers. Now, they usually save the whole numbers for maybe first, second grade, maybe third grade. You start learning properties of how to multiply by zero and divide by zero because you're not allowed to do that. But why would they wait? Why wouldn't you just learn zero first? Why wouldn't you learn that in like preschool? Yeah, it's hard to describe nothing. They're, they're not ready for it. Developmentally, imagine this. Imagine you had like a little toddler and they're playing or they have a little piece of candy and you took the candy away from them. What happens? Uh, yeah, you broke their world. You broke their mind for like 10 minutes and they're going to scream their head off. Because they literally can't even comprehend zero. Having nothing. You guys, somebody took a piece of candy from you. I know you'd be a little upset, but the thing is like, you're like, I'll just get another one. Okay? You, you understand zero. You understand having nothing. I can get one later. They don't understand that. They think they're never getting it back. And they can't even comprehend the, the, the waiting period there. So that's a whole number. So it's developmentally, you wait until you're ready for it. When you have zero, you lost. Fine. You get over it. Then the next group that you learn, maybe third, fourth, fifth grade, 
circle with an I. Integers. And these become your new hated thing. Before it was just dividing and multiplying and zeros. Now it's integers. Well, it's integers. It's yeah, because it's about negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. Now you're adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing by negatives. My God, it's hard. You get, don't know where whether it's positive or negative because you don't know where they cancel or they stay together. When you add them, you got to figure out which number is bigger. That type of thing. That becomes your new hated subject in spirit. But it's not bad. Integers um, come in later because what concept do you use integers with most commonly? Yeah, subtraction. But what's like the main thing we use it for? What would we use a negative for? In your life, what, is, what does it apply to you? That's it. Banking, money, cost, in debt, that type of thing. That's what it was actually developed for. The Israelites developed a symbol for numbers when they're past zero. When you're in debt, you owe something. Tax collecting, debt. That was what it was created for. Now we use it for, you know, like sea levels and stuff, or below sea levels, or above sea levels, temperatures, that type of thing. Okay? All right. Now, next category. This is a big category. Start with an R. Rationals, yeah. Rationals. Rational numbers. Now, rational numbers is anything you can write as a fraction. That's the definition, according to most textbooks. If you can write it as a fraction, it's a rational number. The rational numbers are, they're more rational numbers than all the ones above it. Because rationals, you can write any number above as a fraction. How do I write the number two as a fraction? It's a rational number. Negative two over one. That's a rational number. But it's also like one half, one third, one eighth. You can use all those. Anything you write as a fraction. Most people don't realize when you write fractions, those are also decimals. They're the same thing. Like elementary kids don't understand that. Decimals and fractions are literally the same thing. Like 0.25. That's 25 over 100. These are two numbers, so if there's two zeros on the bottom, or it's one fourth. Because you simplify. They're the same thing, right? Most kids don't understand. Or repeating decimals. Like repeating is threes over and over and over and over and over. That's a fraction. It's one third. It's actually three over nine that's been reduced. That's how you get repeating. You just put a nine at the bottom. That's how you always repeat numbers. So if you know if it was 45 repeating, 0 0.45, 0 0.45, 45, it's 45 over 99. That's how you get a repeating decimal. So but anything, so repeating or terminating decimals, decimals that end. But anything that is doesn't end and doesn't repeat, like pi, that's irrational. That's the whole other category that's over here in its own little bubble. They call it irrational because it's so hard to wrap your head around it. And these are radicals, like radical seven, like square root of seven. Square root of seven is irrational. There is no number that you can, that it's a set number that you can multiply it on itself to give you seven. It's like a crazy decimal, it never ends. To give you this concept of this thing never ending, because I, I don't think you appreciate that, it never repeats again. It never comes back to eventually three, one, four, one, five, nine, two, six, and it keeps going. It never does that. So that's why it's never a fraction. Um, that's, and just give you a concept, like, how many people in here have, like, a, a cell phone? Probably everybody, right? Your personal cell phone, 1, 6 for 1, 5, 1, 2, blah, 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 it's in there. Everyone's is, at some point. It's a guarantee. It's a mathematical guarantee. Your social security number, the number you're not supposed to give to anyone in the world, in there at some point. Exactly number for number. That's the concept, because it doesn't end. So there's an infinite possibility of every combination in there. It's in there somewhere. Your birthday, so like mine, was 12... 1982, and I had a certain time that I was born at, right? It's in there. That's the concept, right? That's It's hard to think about. It doesn't end, doesn't repeat, and just keeps going. There's more combinations all the time. Square root of 7 is the same exact idea. Um, and radicals are really difficult for people to understand because where radicals come from are triangles. The Pythagorean theorem is where radicals come from. And so, and those are non-repeating numbers. They don't end, they don't repeat, they keep growing. 
it's so hard to like, justify. That's why they call it literally the word irrational. It's hard to rationalize it, to think about it. Okay, those are the real numbers. They're literally sets. Do you see what I used? I used set notation. And they kept getting bigger. There's unions. Every time you go to the next, it's a union of the new number with the old ones. You go to the next group, it's literally a union of these with the new ones. That's why I showed you that union stuff earlier. Okay, now properties of real numbers, things that we need to learn, okay? Absolute value. We understand what absolute value is. So let me put that on the board here. Okay, so let's describe what an absolute value is. Most people know the symbol. What's the absolute value of five? Five. Absolute value of negative seven. Seven. Okay, so you guys are on the same page. It's not an opposite. It's not opposite. That's what people are, oh, it's just down. No, it's not. Because if it was opposite, the top of this number would have been negative five, for example. It's, it's always positive. Well, the thing is, why? It can't be a negative number or a positive number. It can't be a negative number, but say it again. Because it has to be a spot on the number line. Yeah, it's a spot on the number line. It's literally a distance. How many steps you took? You don't say you took negative steps. That's not how Fitbits work. If you walked a certain distance, you may even go forward or backwards. You're going a distance. That's how absolute value works. It's literally the distance from zero to the number that's in the actual bars. How many steps did you take? You took five steps. You took seven steps to get there. Okay, now, I'm going to give you the definition of putting your book. The absolute value of x is, and yes, it's a bracket. This is actually called a uh, piecewise function, I'm going to write that on the board, it is a piecewise function, broken into pieces, that's what that means, okay, the answer for the absolute value of x is x if x is greater than or equal to zero, so if x is greater than or equal to zero, it's an x, or it's negative x, if x is less than zero. Literally what the book says. Let's talk about that. Because that works for you. Which one? It looks to me, like when you first look at it, it looks like they just told me, according to the definition, that my answer for absolute value could actually be negative. It looks like the answer for absolute value of x is actually a negative x if x is less than zero. So what is this actually saying? Literally, it's not saying that it's a negative x, it's saying it's the opposite of x. That's what it's saying. So, if somebody give me a negative number. Negative 4, negative 17. Doesn't matter what you got. Negative 4 or negative 17, right? So, if we're following this rule, that means, okay, we're on the second track, we're on the piecewise, we're on the second track, because my number, your x, was negative, right? It was less than 0. So, that means your answer will be the opposite of the number you picked. That's what this is saying. So, it's the opposite of the x you picked. Well, what was the x that we first picked? Negative 4, right? That was the x that you picked. That's the x that's sitting right here. So, what's the opposite of that? 4. Okay. You guys picked negative 17. That was the other one I heard. So, what's the, since it's negative, it's less than 0, we have to pick this track. What's the opposite of the x you picked? What's the opposite of negative 17? That's why it's always positive. It's always the opposite if it's the second track, if it's negative. Some people look at that definition in your book. It's literally in your book, and they go, that doesn't look right. They get a misprint there. No, it just means it's the opposite. That's what negative means. It means the opposite. Okay, now, they also do this thing where they, they show you properties of absolute values. So they, they go, okay, you can take absolute values, and you can multiply things together. You know, or, you know, you take x and y, and you multiply them together, and you take the absolute value. That is the same thing. Is taking the absolute value of the first number times the second number. You know, that type of thing. It's the same thing. It's called the separation of absolute values. You can separate them by multiplication. It's called the product rule, technically. That's the correct term for it. 
product rule. They have a quotient rule, same thing, that if you're dividing two numbers inside of the parentheses, inside the absolute value bars, I should say, you can separate them into their own absolute value bars, and it's still the same answer. Because what would your answer be? It would be positive, right? So you can separate them, because this would be a positive and divided by a positive, so you'd be fine. But it doesn't work for adding and subtracting. It doesn't work for adding and subtracting. The property doesn't. It doesn't have a, an addition rule. They call it the triangle property. The triangle rule for absolute value. And this is what they say. That if you're going to add X and Y together, literally add them, not multiply them, add them together on the inside here. This answer will be less than or equal to when you separate them. Why, why could it be less than that? It could be a negative. There could be a negative number in here. So you have a negative and a positive, and that will make a really small number here because they're opposites, right? This could be a negative, that's a positive, they're opposites. So they make a small number. And then these numbers will turn out to be positive because you'll do absolute values first. And then you're going to add and that makes a bigger number, not smaller, bigger. So that's why this could be technically bigger. But it also says it could be equal because if it's positive, 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 then it's still the same number, so they're equal. But it's also called the triangle property because this is how triangles work, and I want you to know this right now. That triangles, anytime you add two walls of a triangle, they should always be more than the third wall. Two walls added separately should always be more than the other wall. So if somebody give me two numbers. Seven and nine. Seven and nine. These two numbers added together should always be bigger than the third wall. Always. So this wall cannot be 16. It has to be things less than 16. Any two walls. There's a minimum. This wall had to be bigger than two. Because anytime you add two walls, it has to be bigger than the third wall. So there's a limit on a triangle. It's what you can have for walls. A lot of people like they try to make up problems on their own, like, oh, Mr. Ward, throw these numbers up there. It doesn't work. Because you have to think about the triangle rule. When you walk around the block, that is always a longer distance than walking in a straight line home. Always longer. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter which path you took. Always be longer than the third wall that you didn't add. And a lot of people won't realize that. It doesn't have to be a right triangle. I didn't know what type of triangle that is. I could figure it out, but it's, I don't know what it is. In fact, I think that triangles are cubes. Okay. Any questions? Okay. That's that's a property of absolute value. It works for just subtraction and solve. So same concept. Okay, so we did some basic, uh, basic properties with that. Now, commutative property, associative, distributive properties. Those properties um, help you simplify problems down, like algebraic problems, numerical problems. The thing, you know the thing I did earlier where I did uh, that big parenthesis with the powers? Those properties are in your book. I think they're like page 12. Most people know them. You know, you know how to perform distribution where you multiply over parentheses. You only have to do distribution when you can't go any further in a parenthesis. What do I mean by that? Because those properties still apply to these. You would not have to distribute on this problem. Why not? Yeah. I can make 9 and then multiply by 3. I don't need to distribute. You only distribute when you couldn't go any further. That's the time when you want to distribute. Now I have to, because I can't go any further. This is algebraic, I can't even simplify it. So it's going to be 3x plus 15. Okay, some people like tend to get that wrong. Or they think this. Like the multiplication dot. If you don't distribute, because you can actually perform the inside operation first. Then you multiply. So what is the rule when you do distribution? You can't go any further. That's when you can dis distribute. That's what I always tell people. Does that make sense now? That's when you distribute. You can't go any 
go for the Okay, back to the whole blue Okay, I'll give you homework tomorrow. I'll give you homework tomorrow. You're ready to go. Hey, what's due tomorrow? Book cover. That's 10 points. Some people already have their 10. Do not forget. Get a book cover.